Let's take just a moment together. Let's have a word of prayer. Then we'll get into the message for today. Father, thank you so much for the encouragement we have from being with fellow believers, encouraging, sharing with each other the things that you've done through the week in our lives, the opportunity you've given us to serve. Thank you, Father, for the privileged opportunity you've given us to have folks who love and are concerned about us to help us when we're dealing with difficult circumstances or times of tragic loss or shock or surprise or when we're overwhelmed. We're thankful to have folks to come alongside us to help us and encourage us. Lord, thank you for this assembly. What a blessing it is to come here and be able to sing and to be able to uh, provide gifts to you that would honor and recognize you. We pray that you would be blessed and honored by what we do. Help us as we approach your word. Father, today, uh, certainly, we acknowledge its authority over us. It provides for us the, the uh, covenant terms that you have made very clear. It gives us assurance and confidence that we can know without any doubt we've done what you've asked. We know you're good for your word, and so we pray you'd help us to continue to be a people of your word, to grow and to learn, to be encouraged and equipped to serve you even better. Help us today as we approach your word to understand and apply it correctly and to provide you with the benefits that you deserve, glory and honor and service. May you bless now this time together as we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to take you, if you would, back to the book of Revelation, Revelation 21, a comment that Jesus has made. This is recorded by John in the vision that he was shown about uh, heaven and being able to be in that place of eternal presence of God. Wonderful, wonderful thing. And John writes to us some of what he saw. He's not allowed to write all of it, but he describes some of it. In Revelation chapter 21, beginning with verse 3, it says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold... The tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right. For these words are faithful and true. What a powerful promise God has made to take those things that were broken or marred, those old things which included things like illness and death and, and loss and discouragement and remove it all. And instead to make all things new. In Christ, as we've already examined through Paul's writings in Ephesians, we have seen what God has promised for us. Today I want to go a little bit further. And I want to talk about the idea of redemption that we sang a little bit about earlier. And the scene that uh, we just heard about in terms of being in the presence of God and seeing these wonderful promises now realized. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, beginning with verse 13, the the Bible says, in him, again, speaking about what God's done for us in Christ, in him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith uh, in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all." 
This text in Ephesians that we've been working through has so much powerful encouragement for us in terms of the promises of God, the effectual working of God in the lives of those who have agreed with His terms, and then he qualifies in this text for us what that involves. It involves the idea of hearing the gospel, agreeing with the gospel or believing, submitting to the terms that are in the gospel, which is implied, and then we see God's wonderful work in us. Promises and His work continually ongoing while we are here. What a great blessing. What an encouragement for us to find in these pages. Well, I want to address some of the phrasing that's here in Ephesians 1. We're going to go back and look at verses 13 and 14 where it uses the phrase sealed in Christ. And I do this because there has, um, in, in Christianity, existed an idea about the phrase sealed and it comes from a misunderstanding of that word and the Thus, a misapplication. The idea is clear in Scripture. Let's go to Ephesians 1. Read those first couple verses again together. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In Him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. Now, the Holy Spirit has a way of working through the pen of the Apostle Paul that really gives us a lot of meat to chew on there. There's an awful lot Paul has stated for us to hold on to and to find assurance in. And one of those phrases is the idea of being sealed, but he uses some other descriptive terms to help us understand how we're to understand or apply the idea of being sealed. The idea of it being something that he's done for us in the Holy Spirit. The idea of it being something which is effectual toward uh, completion. The idea of it being a, a pledge or a promissory that God has made for us. And that it will be for our benefit, but to His glory. He will be praised. He will be honored for what He has effectually done in Christ for us. The idea of being sealed, oop, I'm sorry, hit it, went back too far. The idea of sealed comes from a couple of different passages, but it's used with this understanding in only eight passages in the New Testament. In that list are some passages in the book of Revelation, and it speaks specifically to 144,000 who are sealed. Now, I've mentioned there are people who have an ideology or a, a religious worldview that takes the idea of being sealed, and they understand it differently than how it's presented in Scripture. It's actually contradicting what we hear of the nature and character of God and His action of saving or redeeming us. And they hold to this as a primary basis for how they view all things in terms of their life in Christ and their forgiveness. The idea of being sealed for those in Christianity who hold to that idea, they think that means that God has somehow encapsulated them or preserved them and will not allow them to be marred or marked or stained or removed from those who are saved. They instead will be preserved, they will be upheld in spite of their own decisions or their own actions. They cannot be lost. God has sealed them up and they're saved. Now there are many passages in the New Testament which speak contrary to that idea. In fact, I'm going to tell you, I had a, I had a discussion about this just this uh, uh, just yesterday and the day before uh, while, while uh, talking with some folks who were at the funeral home and uh, others. We were in discussion about different things. We uh, talked about the idea of being preserved by God and never having the opportunity to be lost. But the preponderance of New Testament teaching is filled with cautionary teaching. 
It's filled with the understanding that we indeed can remove ourselves from the Lordship of Jesus. We can, after having acknowledged Him as Christ, abandon Him as our Lord and walk in a way that is not in favor of God's teachings or that's foreign to the Lordship of Jesus. In fact, some of the texts that people pull from and say God has preserved and He has maintained and He has sealed in that sense come from the book of Revelation, but they fail to acknowledge, they fail to recognize the book of Revelation also speaks about a caution saying do not allow your name to be removed from the Lamb's book of life. Now if a name can be removed, that means a name was written to begin with. What does that mean? It means someone set their course to follow Christ and at somewhere, at some point, made a cognitive decision and in their life actions abandoned the Lordship of Jesus and as such were removed from the benefits of salvation. You see, as I've said so many times, God will not work contrary to our wishes. Our free will is honored by our Creator. He allows us to choose if we will follow Jesus and be compliant to His covenant terms or if we will abandon them. He doesn't force. He doesn't coerce. He takes us where we are and responds accordingly. So the idea of being sealed here is not the idea that somehow God has encapsulated or protected us uh, from anything that could prevent us from having our faith impaired or abandoned. That is not what we find here. And the other idea comes from a cult teaching from specifically, um, among others, but mainly from the Jehovah's Witnesses that teaches that there's only 144,000 who will be saved. And the rest will somehow just inherit another place, but only the 144,000 are going to be in heaven. Now, there's another thing we have to keep in mind when it comes to the right understanding and application of Scripture. Sometimes the Bible indeed uses very literal terms and references that are important for us to understand. These, you can call them commands, these direct teachings are things God has noted which are very important and to remove any confusion, He has emphatically stated them so that they are clear, they are literal expectations. They are not something that is figurative. But then there are times in Scripture where the Bible does use illustrative ideas, portraits or phrasings that are figurative. They're used to, to illustrate, but they complement, always complement and cooperate with literal ta uh, teachings or doctrines in Scripture. In fact, to have a proper understanding... To look at something in a literal way, it will never be in contradiction with the illustrative things that God has used, and the opposite is true as well. The illustrative, figurative things will never contradict the known literal teachings of Scripture. So we look at this idea that's presented by these cult teaching, these religious groups, and they say only 144,000 are going to be saved. That's what it says in the book of Revelation, the seventh chapter. Well, I'm not going to read those texts for you this morning because there's, like I said, about six of them in Revelation that are found. And, and if, you, if you're curious or if you've not read them, you can go and look in Revelation 7 and see those passages. But it speaks about a scene. It talks about the idea of God's redemption, and it mentions the 144,000. And it's it says specifically of the sons of Israel. So if, let's say, and not to pick on them, but let's just use the Jehovah's Witnesses as an example now. They're the ones that prom promoted this 144,000 idea. If that idea of being sealed is correct, then let's think about this. The sons of Israel, the tribes of Israel, are the ones who are going to be saved. But we've got a little bit of an issue here. Verse, I said I'm not going to read them all. I'll read verse 4. <laughs> Probably read another too. And I heard of those, a uh, number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Now, if that's true, that tells us something here. That tells us that only those who are a part of the tribes of Israel will be in heaven, according, if that's literal, as they suggest. But that leaves us with something Jesus said in Matthew 8 that contradicts that idea. Because Abraham... Isaac, 
and Jacob were not a part of the tribes. So that would mean, if their suggestion is true, 144,000 sealed and saved, that means Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not in heaven. But what did Jesus say in Matthew 8, 11? I say to you, Jesus saying this, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. What did Jesus say about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? He said, they will be in heaven. So if the 144,000 suggestion is that only that number saved, and it's actually, it's literal, then that would mean Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are outside, and Jesus was wrong. Let's go a little further in this idea. What about the Gentiles who are not mentioned in that text in Revelation? What about them? In Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 15, the apostle Peter and the other apostles had something quite different to say. They said the Gentiles have been saved just as the Jewish people have been saved, just as we have. They had at Acts chapter 10 a situation just like the Jews had at Pentecost in Jerusalem. Uh, Peter defending this in chapter 11 and then before the others in Jerusalem in Acts 15, Peter and the others, all of the leaders from, from the church acknowledged God has saved the Gentiles. Now, keep in mind, the apostles having the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at the, the measure that God apportioned for them, when they were speaking these things, it was revealed by the Holy Spirit and it was God speaking. And they are saying, effectively, God is saying the Gentiles are saved. But if the 144,000 is all that made it in, well, you had to just be a part of the tribes of Israel and the Gentiles aren't mentioned. Contradicts what we know. Let's go a little further. Revelation chapter 7, another text I said I wouldn't read. Verses 9 and following. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every tribe or every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes. Palm branches were in their hands. They were crying out with a loud voice, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The language here is very clear. A crowd, a multitude which could not be numbered more than the 144,000, which is explicitly stated. A crowd, a multitude which contained people from all over Every nation, every tribe, every tongue, the Bible says. Not just the sons of Israel, the tribes that is suggested by this idea from the Jehovah's Witnesses. That tells us something then. That helps us to realize there is an understanding of what God was saying in being sealed. We know it does not contradict with the nature of God in as much as it's not God is encapsulating and preserving us so we will not fall. That's contrary to God's teachings and character. So we know that's out. We know the 144,000 idea is out because we know it's not just the tribes. In fact, I'm, I'm going to say this. If you read through that carefully, you're going to note two tribes were not even mentioned. And there was another tribe, the tribe uh, that was, was mentioned was not actually a tribe. <laughs> but there are two tribes that are missing, the tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Dan. Uh, let me kind of give you a little bit of context of what's going on there. Do you know who was from the tribe of Ephraim? Joshua. Joshua was one of my favorite men in the Bible. This dude followed the Lord as hard as he possibly could. But now, if that idea of the 144,000 or just the sons of the tribes of Israel say, well, uh, sorry, Joshua, we can't let you in because Ephraim wasn't named and you're a part of the tribe of Ephraim. Or then there's the tribe of Dan. Do you know who was a part of the tribe of Dan? Samson. Now, Samson had good and bad, just like David. But that would mean Samson and everyone else in the tribe of Dan would not be saved. In fact, following uh, really strictly through that idea in Revelation, we're going to find that only men would be saved in that 144,000. And only men who had never been in any way sexually involved with a woman, 
the Bible then tells us there's a way to understand what is meant by sealed and it must be different from that preservationist idea or that idea of the 144,000. So how are we sealed? Well, let's go back and look at what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 tells us verse 21 and following that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit as a pledge. Now he who established us with you in Christ and anointed us in God also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Here we find another term that cooperates with the idea of understanding what sealed means. The Bible is pretty clear here with regard to how we understand this idea if we look at what the Bible says. The Scripture teaches us with this term, this phrase, and its use to be consistent. It's a legal phrasing. It's kind of like a financial phrasing that helps us understand that it is a first installment, a first payment. Now, we all know the pains of buying a house, getting a mortgage, or buying a car, or a truck, or a van, or a skateboard, whatever we can afford in this economy. We know what it's like to go and to fill out the form and have those 14 years worth of payments that you're making to get that thing yours. And you know that first payment you make, most often, especially if you're buying a vehicle, is a down payment. It's a surety. It's a guarantee. It's a pledge. It's the first step in saying I'm good for the terms to which I've agreed. But I also know the house where I'm living until the mortgage is fully paid doesn't belong to me. The vehicle I'm driving, so long as I'm making payments on it, it isn't mine until I've paid for it in full. The down payment goes toward a future realization of something. Now, before we go too far, I want you to know, God has paid, not us. Okay? But he has rendered this payment in the terms that we would comply in faith and faithfulness to the Lordship and acknowledgement of his son Jesus. The payment has been made sufficient for the entire action of forgiveness. In fact, the Bible even speaks of a retroactive payment through it, paying for those who were born and died under the law. The payment God made is the blood of Jesus, sufficient to cover the entire debt. And God has said, so long as you walk in the terms, you're good. And he uses the phrase redeemed. The idea of being sealed is we are in a covenant agreement with God and the Holy Spirit serves in us in other ways as well, but serves in us as a part of this promissory God has made. He has pledged. He has certified. He has guaranteed. He has given surety. He has made known His terms are good if we walk within them. That certification, that idea of being genuinely verified or authenticated happens only in Christ and it is affirmed in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That is how we are sealed. Within God's promise of redemption, he says, here's the deal. Walk within it, and you're good for the ultimate realization of what will happen so long as you are in the terms of the Lordship of Jesus. God has done this. We use the idea of a promissory sometimes or a note of surety, but this is actually a legal type of agreement. And it goes a little further than that because it's a covenant God has made and we are the beneficiary of it. God being the benefactor, we receive the benefit. Now, if that's the case, then why are we sealed? To what end or to what effect does God give us this promised Holy Spirit as a pledge for this event? What is 
the effect. Let's look. In the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the Bible says, verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed, for the day of redemption. Now listen, we sing songs when a person commits their life to Christ. When they come out of the grave, whether it's at a baptismal like this, or a pond, or a creek, or a swimming pool, or a water tank. When they come out of that, we often sing songs that talk about the promises God has made. And the pledge, and the surety we have that our sins are cleansed. But remember, we can step out of that at any time. We can walk away from the Lordship of Jesus and abandon His promise, His covenant, and forfeit the terms of salvation. So our covenant compliance comes into play here. And when we're sealed with the Holy Spirit as a pledge, it is to the ultimate effect of our being redeemed. And the Bible describes this in clear terms as being in the presence of of God following our judgment. Jesus identifies those who in covenant agreement have been redeemed and he redeems them at that point. Payments made, ready and waiting. That is the event. In Galatians chapter 4 verses 4 and following it says, When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so he might redeem those who were under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. God's payment is clear. His terms are clear. Our agreement, based as we've already read, which comes from our hearing the gospel, agreeing or believing with the gospel, and as is implied, submitting to its terms with the Lordship of Jesus, then God provides us that indwelling presence, that seal, that assurance, that confidence, that agreement that we've met His terms for the redemption yet to come. 1 Peter 1, 17 says this, In the meanwhile, if you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of of Christ. How ought we to live now? We ought to live with incredible, overwhelming love for what God has done for us through Jesus. We ought to live with an overwhelming drive to share with others what God has done for them through Jesus so they can hear the terms, the gospel, so they can have the opportunity to agree and to follow and live and have that promise. We ought to live in a way that honors and serves and glorifies Jesus in every way as the Bible speaks here in a way that shows our reverence. We ought to live in reverent fear, not thinking God's going to put his thumb on us, but under the understanding I want to live a life that honors Jesus. I don't want to even get close to erring or failing him as my Lord understanding that our payment made in full was in the blood of Jesus. That's the promise. That's the pledge. That's the seal, the promissory God has made. The pledge is for our redemption. The pledge, the seal, is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as a promissory, a first recognition of what God has done. The Holy Spirit affirms for us God's promise is good. The question is whether we will walk within that covenant with Christ. What a powerful promise God has given. What a choice He's laid before you. Where are you in the process of that determination of Jesus as Lord? Do you have the acknowledgement and the recognition of Him as Lord in your life? Have you confessed Him before others? Have you been identified with His death, His burial, His resurrection, do you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? The Bible's clear about where, when, and how we receive that. If not, then I would urge you to consider making Christ your Lord today so you'll have that promise of redemption. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for Your promise, Your pledge. 
We thank you for the seal that we have in Jesus, recognizing through the Holy Spirit that it's not some sort of way that you preserve us in that sense or work against us if we choose to fail and abandon Christ. But instead, Father, that we certainly are to live in reverent fear, recognizing our spiritual condition is frail if we step outside Jesus, we're lost. We want to live in a reverent fear that acknowledges Jesus as our Lord with the assurance of that seal of the Holy Spirit, your pledge, your promise to our redemption yet to come. What a beautiful thing it is to think that we will stand in your presence, Jesus acknowledging that we have been purchased by his blood and it's sufficient enough to cover the sins we've done. May you bless us so that our life can be an honor and, and a blessing to you. Guide us in all that we do that we would be able to serve you effectively. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.